Well, again, the, the approach to swine flu is the same approach that you and I have to, to any respiratory infection and influenza. And these are the things that your mother taught you. Right? Cover your mouth when you sneeze, throw away the Kleenex, wash your hands. If you're sick, stay home. Especially if you've got someone with a febrile illness, you want to stay home. Don't share what you've got with your friends. And then if somebody is significantly sick, then you call the doctor. And the other thing that I think is particularly important right now is that having influenza is not an automatic requirement that you head to the emergency room or to your own doctor. Use your own judgment here. That in fact, the vast majority of people, be it swine flu or any other influenza, are going to do just fine with the kind of care that you get at home, uh, taking care of yourself or, or taking care of those you love. The, the idea of the face masks are of dubious benefit. Now, where are the face masks, face masks proven to work? We use face masks in the hospital. If we have a patient with proven influenza, then we do two things, and this stems out of the kinds of transmission that you and I talked about already. First off, of course, anybody with influenza is going to spray bits of virus about three to six feet. So we put a mask on to protect you if you're going to get close to that patient. Then the other thing we do is we put on gowns and gloves because if we're going to touch that patient or touch anything around them in the environment, it's important then that we have things that we can remove and then wash our hands very carefully. So gowns, gloves, and masks used together is actually quite effective at protecting people from getting influenza. But to just wear a mask without washing your hands or wearing gloves or to just wear gloves and not wear a mask sort of makes as much sense as locking one car door and not the other. You know, the, the bad guy can still get in. I don't, think, I don't think there's any reason to use face masks. And currently in Chicago, I don't think there's any reason to avoid being out in public. Uh, influenza doesn't transmit that effectively in open spaces. Most transmission occurs in places like within families or in child care centers. The first thing is we don't need to test everybody that is suspected of having influenza because by and large most of them will not have influenza. The people that need to be tested are the people who have influenza-like uh, symptoms, fever, uh, respiratory tract disease, uh, rigors and so on, and who have been in an epidemiologic area such as Mexico City, such as Southern California, specific counties, or areas in Texas where we know uh, that swine flu cases exist. But for the average patient who shows up in an office with flu symptoms, I would treat them the way we would treat any patient with flu, which is symptomatic management, unless they are at high risk of complicated disease, and then we would discuss doing a diagnostic procedure and antivirals. So if, if, say, in a week's time we have 100 cases in the metropolitan Chicago area, it really boils down to how virulent the flu we're seeing is. If it continues its current course of not being terribly virulent, we should manage swine flu the same way we manage flu flu, which is symptomatic management. If, on the other hand, we start seeing a greater degree of virulence in the virus, if it really does start to kill people, then we have to be more concerned and more aggressive. Now, the other thing we have to remember is that each year in America, regular old flu kills between 15 and 20,000 people. So we should expect that there will be some mortality associated with this influenza virus. The real question is, is there going to be excess mortality from what you'd normally expect? One of the terms that epidemiologists will use is outbreaks, epidemics, and pandemics. An outbreak is an occurrence of disease either in a restricted population or in a restricted locale. For instance, we could have an outbreak of influenza in Chicago. And well, what we're saying then is influenza is occurring in metropolitan Chicago, but it's not occurring in St. Louis. When we talk epidemics, now we're saying that there's a high level of disease across a population. 
a high percentage, and this varies in diseases that are being talked about, but you might say that 10% of people or 15% of people across groups and geographies, then you have an epidemic. Pandemic then applies a global distribution of disease. And so in the years when influenza is especially bad and widespread, these are the pandemic years where it really does cross not only national borders, but cultural groups and everything else. So the question is, will this virus really go pandemic? Hard to know. But it is interesting that in the past, most pandemic strains, when they show up, they show up big. Uh, they come rolling in, and it seems like we're nothing we can do about it. Here, it seems to be sort of starting up in, in dribs and drabs. The, the essential element for a pandemic flu is efficient human-to-human -human transmission. In other words, it's not enough that the virus simply makes somebody sick, right? Bird flus do that. But bird flus don't transmit effectively human to human, and this is why we don't see bird flu pandemics. So what we're really now waiting to see is, does swine flu transmit efficiently person to person? And if the answer is no, which seems to be the case so far, then I don't think we have the recipe for a pandemic.